You're listening to The Creative Imposter, episode 114. Welcome to The Creative Imposter. I'm Andrea Klender, your guide in this series of travel stories to cure our creative wanderlust during a global pandemic. Today's story comes from one of my podcasting colleagues, Sarah Mikatel, the creator of Podcasting Step by Step, a show about, you guessed it, podcasting and Postcard Academy, celebrating women who love to travel, no major life-altering breakdown a la Eat, Pray, Love required, and helping us find the freedom to pursue the lifestyle of our dreams. Sarah was also featured on Podcast Envy episode 72 with a deep dive into how she went from working corporate in NYC to podcasting in the UK, and then launching her own podcast coaching and consulting business. That episode will be linked in the show notes for this episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 114, along with recent episodes of her show, Podcasting Step by Step, featuring yours truly, sharing how to love your podcasting voice. We'll also, of course, be linking to Sarah's website, sarahmicatel.com, and socials. In just a few moments, you'll hear in our conversation one of the common themes amongst creatives who wind up launching a podcast, which is that we are often creating something that we wanted, that we looked for, and couldn't find. If that resonates with you, if there's something you've been wanting, conversations you've been wanting to hear, topics you've been wanting to explore, people you've been wanting to meet, maybe podcasting is in the cards for you in 2021. Yes, it's got to be better than 2020 anyway. I am offering my final launch your podcast online class of the year, Thursday, October 1st at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And it will include some interactive time to explore your idea and whether podcasting is right for you. And we'll determine what your custom next right step is. The link to register is, of course, in the show notes, which you can find in the episode description in your app. One last thing. I want to know who you know. Do you know a creative business owner local to your geographic area who sells products and services that would make awesome holiday gifts that can be purchased online? I may want to feature them on an upcoming episode of The Creative Imposter. Send them my way by emailing andrea at thecreativeimposter.com or DM me their account on Instagram at thecreativeimposter so I can see if they will fit into my upcoming series. Quick note, this conversation was recorded earlier this summer, so you will hear Sarah and I referring to August as if it was the future. Time. What does it even mean anymore? Just go with it. All right, so today we are talking about travel because many of us are feeling stuck. Well, at least I'm feeling stuck. And I don't know if that is also applicable to you right now where you are. Well, I used to live in London, but now I live in a really gorgeous beach town about an hour south of London. And I don't think I could be in a better place for quarantine. Like I go walking on the beach every day and yeah, I I love it here. So I'm feeling okay. That's amazing because I'm in Chicago and we have Lake Michigan and we have a beautiful lakefront and it has been closed. No access to the lakefront is permitted because Chicagoans are irresponsible and cannot be trusted being left to their own devices in the summertime. They will congregate in large groups close together with no facial coverings. And so the mayor was like, cool, you don't get the lakefront this summer. They had to ruin it for everyone. Yeah, I miss beaches and lakefronts. I'm very jealous of you. Yeah, I'm actually traveling soon, though. I haven't seen my family in quite a long time. And so I'm going to fly back to the States in mid-August, which is going to be an interesting adventure. I think my sister's a nurse, and she's telling me, like, buy a mask, buy eye goggles. Eye goggles. She was telling me the story of somebody, some scientist, I think, who caught corona and he was wearing a mask the whole time and he thought he got it on the plane and he suspects he got it through his eyes. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. 
Like, if that's true or not, but my, that, this is the guidance my sister's giving me. <laughs> Disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are for entertainment purposes only and are no substitute for sound, medical, or legal advice. So are you traveling? What is your passport? What passport do you travel on? Depends on where I'm going, but okay. I have a U.S. <laughs> one and an Italian one. Do you have dual citizenship between the United States and Italy or how does that work? Yes, I have dual citizenship. Okay. I was just wondering because I'm having anxiety about the fact that American passports currently are not accepted for entry into a, a lot of places. Oh, you're an American? Nope. Sorry, you can't come in here, infected, contagious, zombie apocalypse mm-hmm. person. Um, <laughs> and so is there any risk factor for you traveling to the United States and then seeking re-entry? To be honest with you, this is something that worries me a lot. And I think think not. I mean, I have an Italian passport, so I'm an EU citizen. I also have permanent settlement status here in the UK. I have my own apartment. Okay. You know, I pay taxes. And so I have every right to come back here because this is my home. I've been over here for 10 years. But I mean, not everyone who's at the border knows what all the rules are, you know. And right, yeah. so I, it is something that makes me a bit nervous, to be honest. Interesting. And then depending on where your parents are... They're in the Northeast. So in Chicago, we have this weird rule right now that is for anyone who is entering the city of Chicago from a coronavirus hotspot, which is a list of designated states for now. They don't have countries on there, but they have states that you are required, quote unquote, to self-quarantine for 14 days upon entering the city limits before you can go out in public. This is a completely unenforceable rule. And I don't know how many people travel into the city for long enough to quarantine for 14 days and then go about their business of why they came into the city for. I mean, I don't know how bad it is where you are right now. Do you have any visions of like self-quarantining yourself for 14 days or anything like that? I do because my family wants me to. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, normally I go back to the U.S. twice a year at Christmas and at summertime. And these days I'm trying to go back more and, you know, live a more location independent lifestyle where I can spend more time at home because my sister had a baby two years ago and my nephew is the best thing in the world. And so I want to see more of of him. But normally when I go back, I'll go visit my friends in New York City. Sometimes I'll go to DC to visit friends down there. So I do, I do it up. You know, I do like the grand tour of the US when I go back. And this time I'm not going to be doing that. So I'm just going to, flying into Boston, I'm going to quarantine for 14 days at my parents' house. And I'm just going to stay with my family the whole time. And so we've got a road trip to Maine planned for like a weekend, but that's after my quarantine period is over. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. Let's talk about better things. Let's okay. talk about, <laughs> let's talk about when did the travel bug first bite you? Either when was your first trip overseas or when did you know that you had to get the heck out of Dodge? Well, I didn't really travel internationally too much with my family growing up. We went to Canada like twice with my dad on a work trip. But then when I was in college, when I was 18, I decided I wanted to spend the summer in England. So I ended up getting a summer job in the Lake District because back then you could get these like blue cards. Students could get blue cards and just do these like hotel jobs, pub jobs, um, seasonal jobs. And so I got a blue card and then went to work at this inn in the most beautiful region. Still in my mind to this day, the Lake District is the most gorgeous place that I've ever been. And I was a chambermaid slash waitress and it was the most grueling backbreaking work I've ever done. I still have memories of like scrubbing the bathtubs and serving breakfast at the crack of dawn and despite like that really hard labor which I'm like grateful for because it like humbled me and I think all teenagers should have to have that experience. I second this recommendation. I fell in love with England you know on my off days I would go walking through the countryside and it was my first taste of like pub life. I mean I was 18 and I could like legally go into the pubs and I loved seeing how People just mixed around more when it comes to age. Like in the States, from what I remember experiencing, people sort of segmented themselves by age. So like a young person would never hang out with an older person. But at these pubs, I was seeing young people hang out with their grandparents. And I don't. I really loved that. Yeah, I think in college, the idea of going to the bar with your grandpa is 
generally not the yeah, first thought. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the new generation's different. Maybe they're more open-minded. <laughs> I hope they are. But back when I was a teenager, that wasn't the case until I experienced it for myself. And then I was like, oh, this is really cool. I love learning from people who are way older than me. And now I love learning from people who are way younger than me. So it was a really eye-opening experience. And I always knew I wanted to go back. So I actually did go back the next year. I studied abroad in London, but then many years went by before I figured out how I could like legally do that. Because when you're a student, you can study abroad, you can get like those blue cards for like being cheap labor for them. <laughs> but as an adult, um, it was it took me a long time to figure out how to make it happen. Then did you just know right away from your first trip that you were going to be traveling, that you were not going to be landlocked in the United States forever? Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, definitely it all started when I was 18 doing that job and just being on my own and independent and making money and traveling around. So even when I was working at the Lake District, I still was able to like go to Scotland. I was able to go to London for the first time. And then when I studied abroad every weekend, we were going either somewhere else in England or to another country. And I was like, oh my God, this is the life that I want. Because it's so easy to travel around to different countries when you're based somewhere in Europe. Whereas we're in the US, like most people I know, if they go on a trip to Paris, that's like their trip of the lifetime. And then they don't, then they don't go back. Yeah. It requires a lot more effort and planning. Whereas in Europe, it's easier logistically and also more just a way of life. I think it's just culturally yeah. more normal. There's also something I think about getting travel experiences, especially international travel experiences in different cultures when you are younger as we age, we become risk averse. And if we haven't already built that muscle for going on an adventure and exploring and taking those calculated risks and learning just how resilient we actually are when things don't go according to plan, I think we miss out on that in our adult years. I remember traveling to France, my first trip abroad when I was 16 years old in high school. And really, I'm surprised our French teacher let us go off on our own in the metro system in Paris. But we didn't die. Nothing horrible happened. And everything turned out okay. And those adventures on our own were some of my best memories that I have to date. And we found ourselves in many probably not so safe situations, but always used our brains to find a way to be resourceful and get ourselves out of them and back to safety and back to loving our travel experience. I am so grateful to my mom that she didn't listen to those other overly cautious moms when they said, I can't believe you're letting your teenager go to Europe. Thanks, mom. Let's talk a little bit about podcasting. Okay. You are the creator, host, producer, editor, et cetera, of two shows, Postcard Academy, which I think you started in 2017 yeah. mm -hmm. when I looked it up, and Podcasting Step by Step, which is a little bit newer. That came out, when did you that start? Was that was last year. One? Last year. And so Postcard Academy, travel-based, travel stories, tips, advice, destination information and then podcasting step by step is in support of your podcast consulting and coaching business so obviously more about podcasting itself how did you get into podcasting what was the idea to start postcard academy well i had always listened to podcasts you know i've always been a commuter like commuting on my legs i don't have a car but i walk around a lot <laughs> commuting on my I legs like to listen to things <laughs> and so i had been listening to them from like the very beginning but it did not even occur to me to start my own podcast for years and years cuz i'm not like i wouldn't consider myself a technical person i'm not into technology i don't care about it I like listening to stories and, you know, talking to people and things like that. And one of my jobs over here in England, so I worked with a lot of different clients, my backgrounds in marketing and communications. And so I fell into this marketing role at a startup and was producing their podcast. And the more that I did, it, I was like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> and so, but the hours at this startup were manic and I didn't really have any time to plan any trips, but I still like being over here in England. I can see myself here forever, but like every other expat, we're always like, I don't know, maybe I'll end up somewhere else. And so while I'm here, I want to be able to like still travel and explore, you know, in normal times. 
And so I just wanted to like listen to a podcast to tell me everything I wanted to do in the city I wanted to visit. I didn't want to have to read a book or like a million different blogs. I just wanted to listen to a podcast. That's pretty much how I learn everything these days. I think the internet has rotted my brain and I can't really like (laughs) read as much as I used to. I have to say, I'm actually kind of nostalgic for those early travel experiences where we used to lug around that big, thick, lonely planet or let's go Europe guidebook and arrive in a destination with just a couple of pages of recommendations for coffee shops, cafes, restaurants, tourist destinations, museums, shops. And then half the time you would be wandering around with this paper map trying to find this place only to discover that it went out of business last year or you're not anywhere near where you thought you were on the map or you find the place and it's Nothing at all like Lonely Planet described it to be. I mean, doesn't having a smartphone and Google and GPS and yes, even travel podcasts take some of the mystery and adventure out of it? I just wanted a podcast to tell me exactly what to do in the city I wanted to go to. And I couldn't find what I was looking for. And I wanted it to be not just a travel podcast, but I wanted to feature other expat women like myself and give them more of a platform and just show other women and girls that you don't have to be in crisis to travel. You can be a happy person and, you know, and you can be like, know who you are. You don't have to be like this wandering lost person like oh, I just went through a horrible divorce and I'm so lost and who am I and all of this it's the yes. you pray love <laughs> yeah yeah I like to feature women and we talk about their adopted city and how they made it happen and get their insider food and culture tips I will say that I am shifting a little bit it's still quite travel heavy but I also am moving into how to become location independent and a lot of live your best life stuff as well because I think it's all hand in hand you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is what I mentioned in the intro about podcasters creating the thing that we want and look for and can't find. If you're curious to hear more about Sarah's podcasting journey and strategy, I would love for you to go check out my conversation with her over on Podcast Envy, episode 72, which you can find, of course, linked in the show notes for this episode. We also get into a pretty meaty conversation about the concept of what it's like to work for yourself and be your own boss and try to remove yourself from this hustle and grind, must produce, must produce, must always be producing mentality that we seem to have here in the United States that, guess what, doesn't exist in every other culture. Hmm. I had asked you to think about whether there was a time or a story or an experience that you felt was really life changing for you amongst your travels. I mean, you've been to, I don't know, do you know how many countries you've been to? I haven't counted them. For me, it's (laughs) never been like, it doesn't really matter. (laughs) It's not like putting pins in the map of like how many destinations. No, I think that's kind of cute when people do that, but it's (laughs) never like I'm not numbers driven. (laughs) So, you know, I always have countries that I want to go back to. I have new countries that I want to visit, but I don't have a number like I want to visit every country in the world. That doesn't really matter to me. Do you have a particular story that you can think of? I mean, I probably have a handful of stories that I felt were very pivotal for me that were informative for the rest of my life or how I think of myself even in terms of my identity that could only have happened while traveling. Definitely. I mean, so it's like my 10 year anniversary of being permanently based in Europe. So yeah, 10 years ago, right from right now, I moved to Italy. I discovered that because of my Sicilian heritage, I was eligible for an Italian passport. So I started to apply for this when I was still living in New York and it was gathering all the documents for this. And you have to get all of your family history translated into Italian so you can send it to the Italian consulate. And so I was going through this process and the translator I found for this said, you know what, I tried to apply in New York as well. And they're really tough. They reject people like for no reason. I would just go to Italy if I were you and apply there. 
So based on this information, I packed up everything in New York and (laughs) moved to Italy and got my passport. And so I think that whole first year, and it wasn't my first time living in Italy. I had done like two months here and there before then. It's kind of like tasters. But this time I had burned the bridges, is that what they say? Burned the boats (laughs) and (laughs) and moved to Italy. And how I think of myself, the values that I have, how I think of like my home country, all of that has changed over the last 10 years. Kind of at the beginning of that time, when I moved to Italy, my mom came over at the very beginning and we decided to go to Sicily because my grandfather My mom's dad passed away before I was born, and he was like the Sicilian side. It was his parents who had come over to the United States. And because he died before I was born, I didn't really have that much of a connection to his side of the family. Aside from like once a year in mid-August, we would go to this town in Westerly, Rhode Island, which is like a very Italian-American town. And there would be this big procession with the Virgin Mary And like all the people who went to that church. So my grandfather's side of the family, he had like 11 brothers and sisters. So they were participated in this procession as well. So in the hot sun, we're like walking around with this Virgin Mary with like everyone in town seemingly. And people would come outside of their doors and pin money onto the statue. And then we would go and have like a picnic at one of the aunt's house. But like that was the only connection I had to my grandfather. And so my mom and I decided we wanted to go back to where his parents had come from in Sicily. So we start planning this trip and I find on Facebook this girl who is kind of like, we'll call her my cousin. It was my grandfather's cousin's granddaughter. And so we're related, we're related. (laughs) So anyway, I find her and we're kind of chatting and she tells her family about us. So they invited us to come and stay with them in Italy So we don't know these people at all, but my mom and I are like, let's do it. We really want to go and see this town, Tuza Messina. That's where we were going. So we're flying to Palermo, Italy. Our plane touches down. And as our plane is coming down, I'm like, oh, my God, what have I gotten my mom into? (laughs) Like, We don't know these people. We don't even know if these people are going to be here when our plane lands. So from like getting off the plane to getting out of the airport, I was so nervous that I've just like, I don't know, had screwed everything up. But then there was like this little old man with a sign that said Felici, which is what our family name was before I had like gotten changed a little bit at Ellis Island. And my Italian was not that good at the time. But (laughs) we saw him and I waved and he gave me a big hug. And then it was a two hour drive back to where our hometown was. And the whole time, like, I, I don't know about you, but I always used to think about my great grandparents growing up, like how did how did they make it to the United States? And I was really thinking that on the trip to this town because we're driving for hours and then they live on the coast, but on the top of this sort of mountain. So we're driving the car swirling up the hill. And I'm like, how did my great grandparents ever get out of here? And this was 100 years ago. So it just baffled me. But they welcomed us with open arms. So We stayed at my grandfather's cousin's place. Again, they had never met. But when we arrived, there was sun-dried tomatoes, like tomatoes baking in the sun Uh with salt sprinkled on them to be sun-dried. And they made everything from scratch, like everything. So they were cooking for us for days. She made her own bread. She made her own wine. She made her own soap. They took us around to like their gardens. So that trip, I will remember forever. The thing that I'll really remember is that procession that I used to do in Rhode Island with my mom and like the rest of my family. That came from Sicily. Like my great grandfather brought that to America. And so during these mid-August holidays, when my mom and I visited Sicily, we participated in the procession there. And it was the same thing there where we were carrying Well, the men were carrying the Virgin Mary around through the streets and everybody in town was participating. And it's just this old stone, like ancient Italian town. And there's candles lighting the street. I mean, it was like straight out of The Godfather. (laughs) There was music playing. And my mom was just crying because she was thinking about her dad. And then I'm crying because I never got to know him. And I know everyone says this when people pass away, like, oh, this person was so great. But I really have the feeling that my grandfather was like a very gentle 
type of person who everybody loved. And I hardly ever talk about him to my mom because whenever I do, she gets really, really upset. Even like he passed away decades ago, but it still makes her so upset. And so it was like a spiritual experience to have this with her and to be walking these streets where our ancestors came from. And your mom had never been to Sicily or to Italy prior to that? We had never been to Sicily. She visited me in Italy at one point, like years prior when I was just spending a summer there. But that was more like holiday fun. This, I felt, was kind of like a pilgrimage almost. Pilgrimage, a journey of a pilgrim. Definition number two, the course of life on Earth. Thanks, Merriam-Webster. I think I know what Sarah's talking about, though. When I was backpacking around Europe at age 21, I did make a stop in Augsburg, Germany, which is the small town that my dad and my uncles were born in just outside of Munich before they emigrated to the United States. My dad was only four, so he doesn't really remember it so much. And my uncle had tried to draw me an analog map from memory of the neighborhood that they grew up in and their house and the soccer field. And yeah, once we got there, Nothing looked like what was on that hand-drawn map. But I remember just having this feeling like I belonged there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't speak but a lick of German. And my friend and I were definitely stared at being recognized as outsiders. But there was something so welcoming about seeing all these little old ladies who just reminded me so much of my Oma, even though I hadn't a clue who they were. I asked Sarah if being in this small town in Sicily, where her ancestors came from, created a sense of belonging. I can't remember feelings of belonging, but I remember like tremendous feelings of gratitude to my Hmm. grandparents and just everything that they must have gone through to get to the States. And gratitude to the people who welcomed us into their homes, even though they didn't know us at all and had us sleeping in their beds and, you know, taking us around town. So in in mid-August, like it's all of Italy shuts down pretty much in mid-August holidays. It's hot, right? It's hot, but it's a time of celebration. And so we were in this tiny like mountain town overlooking the sea, but there was like a little different party happening every single night. So, I mean, that was like fun thing to go and check out. And there was like this massive concert in this kind of field and this huge fireworks display that didn't even start until like, I don't know, 12 or one in the morning. <laughs> and we're like, where do they even get the money for this? We're like in the middle of nowhere. And I feel like this is, I don't know, something I would see in a big city. But um, it was fun to to have that sort of community experience that you only have when you are staying with a friend or staying with family, I think. Now, after 10 years of living abroad, do you feel American still or do you feel European or do you feel both or neither? I feel global citizen for sure, for sure. And I know (laughs) some people like don't like that term and I don't know why. I think we should all strive to be global citizen and to get past, you know, our immediate doorstep. Ooh, there's that phrase, global citizen, again. It came up in my conversation with adventurous midlifer Lisa James just a couple episodes ago here on The Creative Imposter, talking about bringing her small children on some adventure travel to experience a new culture. And in this case, I think it applies to something that I've been learning about that is a huge rabbit hole called American exceptionalism, where we have this notion that has been drilled into us since we were young and in school that America is the best and that we are the best because we are Americans and everything else is subpar, lower, less, not as good, not as important, not as special. Whew. I mean, do we really think that? It's kind of awful, but I do think that there's a lot of conditioning that goes into our American brains that may lead us to at least subconsciously think that. And here we have Sarah sharing how this perception can shift when you are, in fact, an expat living in another country, in another culture that you neither love more nor less than your home country. 
yeah, I just feel like I'm a person of the world and I care about what happens everywhere. And I don't feel like what's happening just in my home country is more important than what's happening in the rest of the world. I feel like my heart belongs everywhere. And I, you know, I, I care about what's happening all over the place. Okay, since we're still here in pandemic times, at the moment of recording and releasing this episode, why not? Let's just speculate. What is the future of travel? Are we doomed to shelter in place forever? I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's anything different's going to happen. I think travel is going to go on as it always has. I think, you know, it, it might be a slower start until we get a vaccine. A lot of people won't feel comfortable traveling. But, you know, we're wound up about COVID because we're living in it now. But this is not the first pandemic in the world. I mean, there's been many, many pandemics over the years and life just goes back to normal. I mean, I've learned anything over the last 10 years and, you know, I love history and visiting historical sites and a lot of these sites, like horrific, horrific things have happened on them. And it's shocking to me how fast things go back to normal. And Mm. so I think... Yeah, I think things are just going to go back to normal. I can't think of anything that would happen for better or worse. So, yeah, I I don't think we need to worry. I think everything's going to be okay. (laughs) Ooh, those words are so comforting. But in the meantime, what advice does Sarah have for those of us who are feeling cooped up at home, restless, wander, lusty? Listen to a good travel podcast, maybe even the Postcard Academy. (laughs) I think, you know, when COVID first kicked off, I kept hearing like travels will never be the same again. Travel's dead and travel almost became a dirty word. Like you weren't allowed to talk about it. You can still dream about where you want to go. You're going to get there. We're not going to be in lockdown forever. So I think... Yeah, start planning now. I personally am not a big planner. (laughs) I told you I started my podcast because I wanted to like just get on a plane and listen as I'm flying there what I need to do there. But if you're more of a planner and like you enjoy that type of thing, then create your little vision board and get ready for your next trip. What's on your vision board for your future travels? Take a pic, post it on Instagram and tag me at the creative imposter. Thank you so much to Sarah Mikatel of Postcard Academy and Podcasting Step by Step. Go check out her podcasts. Listen to the continuation of my conversation with Sarah on Podcast Envy. Follow her on social. And don't forget, if you're dreaming of creating the podcast you want to hear, sign up now for Podcast Envy Launch Your Podcast October 1st. There's only nine spots available, and all of it is linked for you in the show notes at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 114. This episode was mixed by Edwin Ruiz of Mondo Machine. Our theme music is by Jovia Armstrong. Transition music and sounds are courtesy of creators on freesound.org who license their music under the Creative Commons. I thank you so much for listening, and this week... I encourage you to take some time to visualize that future you want to create. Mm-hmm.